it's that time again. <clears throat> so uh, we are looking at a test coming up very soon on Unit 3 for Wahai Chem uh, dealing with nuclear chemistry. And uh, kind of the main focus points with this unit, of course, are, are nuclear power, uh, which is sort of that sociological uh, influence, okay? Uh, but our, our main skill sets we're going to focus on here are decay equations and then how to do uh, uh, calculations with half-life and, and age and how much of a sample is going to be left after a certain amount of time and so on. All right. Uh, so this particular tutorial, all right, uh, we are focusing on the exam review that I handed out, okay, for Unit 3, uh, and in particular, uh, numbers 14 and 15 uh, on the decay equation section, and then on the back page there, numbers 17 and 18, which is just a sampling of those half-life type calculations that uh, we've been working on, okay? Uh, so you definitely want to have that exam review with you, and of course you'll also want your handy periodic table, we're going to refer to that often and calculator for some of those more complex calculations. All right, well, let's do this. Um, I'm gonna start with green. Green's fun. All right, um, so with number 14 on page number three there, it talks about iodine-122. All right, and so what you guys need to do with this one, it says to, uh, predict the decay type that iodine-122 will, uh, will undergo, and then write the corresponding decay equation for that type of decay, all right? Uh, and I showed you guys two ways to try to determine decay type, uh, and they're not foolproof, but for what we do in high school chemistry and just introducing this topic, uh, it's gonna work for us, okay? So uh, method number one is you can actually use a band of stability to try to determine where Iodine-122 would plot on there. Is it going to be above that stable line, below it, or way the hell out there somewhere? Okay, um, that tells you uh, usually what type of decay it's going to undergo uh, with the three types that we will uh, worry about. Um, or you can compare the mass of this isotope to the average mass, all right? And that will usually kind of get you into the same uh, ballpark as to what type of decay to expect. Okay, uh, so your job, okay, is to remember, okay, if I have a mass that's bigger or too many neutrons or if I'm up here on the chart, what type of decay is that going to be? If I end up down here or my mass is smaller than the average mass, okay, what type of decay will that be? And if I'm way the heck out here with atomic number past 82, what type of decay, okay? And a disclaimer, this is oversimplification but it's a good introduction to just understanding the processes. You guys take nuclear chemistry in college or maybe even in AP chemistry, the complexity level gets a little higher, there's a few more variables involved. But for us, this is gonna be fine as an introduction, okay? Um, so, let's do this, iodine-122. My favorite method, just because it's faster, okay, is just compare iodine-122 to the average mass of iodine. So I find iodine right there. And you'll see if that comes into focus that its average mass is 126.90. Okay, so I'm gonna write that up here, 126.90. Now, with a comparison of 126.90 to 122, okay, we should be able to tell that 122 is obviously lower, okay? So this isotope of iodine, okay, has a mass considerably lower than the average mass of iodine. And what that means to me as a chemistry student, or to you as a chemistry student, uh, is that if we're saying that this type of iodine is unstable, that's probably because the mass is too small, all right? So, and that would mean, in this case, if it is iodine, we can't mess with the number of protons, right? If it's iodine, that means it probably doesn't have enough neutrons, okay? And so the way to think about that is on this table right here where we have pro plot protons and neutrons, that means that iodine would fall 
beneath this stable line right here. So that stable uh, band right there. Iodine 122 would be below that because the number of neutrons, our y-axis, is too low. Okay? So, what do I have to remember now as the chemistry person when I don't have enough neutrons? What type of decay is that? All right? And so, logically, okay, if I don't have enough neutrons, I need more neutrons. Okay? In the nucleus, is there a way I can get more neutrons? And the answer is yes. There's actually two ways you can get more neutrons. I can do that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to turn a proton into a neutron, right? So I'm going to see a drop in my number of protons as a result, okay? Uh, that's how I create a neutron. I can turn a proton into a neutron, and I can do that two ways. I can do it by taking one of those electrons in those outer shells and sucking it in, right? If I fuse a proton and an electron together, I get a neutron, right? So that can turn a proton into a neutron. Or I can take a proton, and I can take a little part of that proton that makes it positive, which is called a positron, and I can jet that out, okay? And uh, there, there's some, some ways to sometimes to, you know, predict which is more likely with certain isotopes. I'm gonna let you choose one of those two routes, okay? Either way, we're gonna end up in the same place, okay? So again, because this number is less than the average max. I'm going to assume that this is a radioisotope because it does not have enough neutrons, which means I need to make some neutrons. And the way I can do that in nuclear chemistry is I can turn a proton into a neutron by either getting rid of a positron or pulling an electron. Either way, I end up in the same place, okay? But that's what you have to kind of figure out as we go through this. All right, so I'm going to predict the K-type is sometimes we can write it like that which could either be positron emission or electron capture alright, one of those two Okay, I'll write both of them for you alright, so let's do electron capture first so equation boom so I'm going to write my symbol for iodine 122 all right, so I'm going to have to use my periodic table to find the atomic number for iodine, which is 53. All right, so this is the radioisotope I'm starting with. All right, if I do an electron capture, that means I'm going to combine iodine 53 with an electron, okay, to produce one neutron. So I'm going to write a symbol for an electron, which looks like that, 0, minus 1, E, okay. Now, as a result of that, I am going to keep my mass the same. So I'm not, because electrons, you have to remember, don't really have a significant mass. So my mass number up here is going to stay the same. Okay? But what I did when I sucked this electron in is one of these protons, written down here as the atomic number, became a neutron. So my number of protons actually decreased, but my total mass, my total number of particles stayed the same. Alright? This is going to be 52 which would mean this is no longer iodine, it is the element that precedes it on the periodic table, which is tellurium, all right? So this was electron capture. Okay, so that is one way to uh, deal with the fact that I don't have enough neutrons uh, in this uh, nucleus of iodine, right? I'm gonna go through an electron capture to create more neutrons. Now, in the case of tellurium-122, we probably still don't have enough neutrons, and we probably take that out maybe through one more beta de or uh, electron capture to bring it down one more. We don't have to worry about these chain equations, okay? But just in case some of you spotted that uh, the mass of tellurium is actually a little bit higher than 122, uh, you know, it's a little side note. But again, that's maybe down the road if you guys take some college chemistry. Hopefully, lots of you guys will do that and be really well prepared because you're spending your time right now getting prepared, right? Uh, or, boom, boom, boom. Okay? I can do the same thing through positron emission. I just write the equation different, but I'm still going to end up here. To learn it, okay? So I'm going to go 122, 53i, right? Now, rather than taking two particles to create one, I'm going to use this one particle of iodine to create two on the other side. It's still going to be 122 
52T. All right, so I'm still going to turn a proton into a neutron, which means my mass is going to stay pretty much the same. Okay, uh, no significant change in mass. All right, but in this case, I'm going to do this change right here by getting rid of a positron, which is essentially a massless, it's like, a, it's like a positive electron, essentially. About the same mass as an electron uh, and a positive charge instead. So the way I write a positron is 0, 1, D. Right? And the difference between the way I write an electron with a negative 1 and a positron is a positive 1. Okay? So, and that is positron emission. Okay, in that case. So on the test or quiz, do not have to write both of these. I'm going to let you choose your path to creating more neutrons, electron capture or positron emission. One of those two. Your job is to know that when your mass is smaller than the average mass, okay, uh, that tells you that you don't have enough neutrons. When you don't have enough neutrons, you've got to make some neutrons. And to make neutrons, you're going to have to use protons to do that. So, when we don't have enough neutrons or a small mass, uh, we're going to drop our atomic number, keep the mass the same, right? Uh, by either getting rid of a positron or taking an electron. All right? Uh, that was a really long-winded response to that. Okay? All right. So uh, on to number 15 now, which is copper 67. So we're going to use the same type of logic we used on the last one, like a little fashion this time, okay? I'm gonna find copper on my periodic table, right? So that is right there, and we find that the average mass of copper is 63.55. So again, I'll write that off to the side, okay? So 63.55 is the average mass of copper. So this copper isotope right here has a mass that's considerably higher than that average, all right? So, like last time, where I had a lower average, I didn't have enough neutrons. If my mass is considerably higher, that tells me, whoa, take it easy. Too many neutrons. Get out of here, you guys. Okay? Uh, so we're going to turn neutrons into protons. We're going to do kind of the opposite of what we did. So when we turn protons into neutrons, we saw a decrease in atomic number. If we turn neutrons into protons, all right, we're going to go up in our atomic number. That's logic, guys. Logic works in chemistry. So think about these things, okay? So your job is to know if this mass is bigger than that mass. And I'm telling you that's a radioisotope. You know, okay, there's too many neutrons. I gotta fix that and make some protons out of those neutrons. And I can do that one way. So I don't get to choose between two ways. I get one way this time. And that is going to be beta emission, right? Or electron emission. So uh, remember how we did electron capture, combining a proton and an electron makes a neutron? Well, if I have a neutron, I can flick an electron out of there to make a proton out of it. All right? So I'm going to get rid of an electron. So I'm going to write my symbol 60, oh, well, 67. And the atomic number of copper is 29. Cu. All right? Too many neutrons, I'm gonna create protons. So if I'm, if I'm gonna create a proton, that means my atomic number is gonna go by one, two, 30, all right? But to create a proton, because I'm getting rid of an electron, um, so an electron emission, electrons don't have enough mass to really make us change our mass number. So this is gonna remain at 67, but because this is number 30, I gotta go to my periodic table and I will see that this is now zinc. All right, now, how did I make this change? I made that change by getting rid of an electron from that nucleus. That's called electron emission or beta emission, okay? Uh, and that would be my corresponding equation. Now, uh, I'm not gonna do an alpha decay with you guys, but the one thing, other thing we have to remember is sometimes, you know, we're trying to use, oh, is the mass bigger or smaller rule? Right? But we gotta remember, if we get to a really big element, okay? So anything past number 82 on the periodic table, usually, or past number 83, okay? Um, we're gonna do an alpha emission. Now, the alpha emissions are often accompanied by some other beta 
uh, positive or beta negative, okay? We're keeping it simple. If you get a mass that's bigger than uh, 83 or 82, right? You've got to remember, oh, you know what? I'm not going to worry about the beta or positron emission inside of this. I'm going to just do an alpha decay to make that nucleus small because that needs to happen, okay? So keep that in that memory. But I'm going to get this. I'm going to spend way too much time here if I try to do all the different types of uh, questions, okay? So uh, anyways, that is our uh, uh, practice with the K equations. We are now going to move on to uh, half-life questions, okay? So moving on to <clears throat> number 17 uh, from the exam review. Uh, so I wrote the question up here, the mass across the 16 samples found to have decreased from 8 grams to 3 grams over 12 years. Calculate the half-life. All right, so again, half-life is a measure of how much time is needed for one half of a radioisotope to decay into something else, all right? Now, again, disclaimer, these questions, these types of questions can get way, way, way more complex than what we're doing. We're just introducing the ideas at this point, all right? So again, if you guys get to college chemistry and you're like, whoa, this is way harder than what Hubert taught us, that's because I'm just introducing it. All right, so we're keeping things kind of at their, their simplest form for now, okay? There, you know, there's a lots of other variables that we have to end up worrying about with these types of questions in, in reality, but we're keeping it simple, okay? Anyways, that disclaimer's done. Number 17, I need to figure out what the half-life of Carlson 60 is, right? Carlson 60, obviously not a real element. I'm just making up funny names from the other chemistry teacher, all right? Uh, but, what information do we have? So we, you guys are gonna get these equations on your test. I'm not gonna make you memorize these, right? And we get H equals the half-life times N, N being the number of half-lives, and the initial mass uh, or initial amount of a radioisotope. All right, is 8.00 grams. Okay, uh, so my equation I can use here, so if I know my initial mass, I know that if I take that initial mass times uh, what has the 0.5 in this equation is referring to half-life, where n is how many half-life periods, I'm going to end up with uh, my final mass, of three grams up here, all right? So these are the two equations you'll get. Mi is referring to the initial amount of the radioisotope, MF is the amount you end up with, okay, after it decays over time. And 0.5, and this is referring to one half for, for half-life, and it's how many times we cut it in half, okay? So these equations, again, you don't have to memorize those, but you do need to know what the symbols mean, all right? Uh, so like I told you guys in class, I like to then come over here and organize my information, because I'm, if I'm going to be dealing with two equations and several different variables, I'm going to organize it. It just helps me. All right? So, mass of Carlson 60. So, my MI in this case, as I already said, is 8.00 grams. My MF in this case is 3.00 grams. Okay? So, this much Carlson 60 decayed to where we're going to have 3 grams remaining. All right? Um, this says it decays over a period of 12 years. So, that's how old the sample is. So, the age of that sample is 12 years, okay? That's all the information I'm given up here, right? So that tells me I don't know uh, T1 half, that's what I'm gonna calculate, nor do I know N. So T1 half equals question mark, N equals question mark. I don't know those values yet. But lucky for me, I can figure them out, all right? So um, with these types of questions, you gotta pick we're generally going to try to, be, try to solve for n first and then use n to solve for whatever else we're going to find, okay? Uh, that's just a basic pattern that we're going to do as we introduce this topic. So, which equation can I use to start? Which one do I know more information for? All right? The top equation, all I know is the age. I don't know the half-life or the number of half-lives. So it would be really hard for me to go through that. I do know my initial and final mass. So the only thing I don't know in the second equation is n. So I'm going to start with equation 2 here. All right? So I'm going to go with 8.00 grams. 
times 0 0.5 to the n, and I should get 3.00 grams. Okay? Uh, so, first things first, I'm going to simplify this equation, <clears throat> and then solve for n. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go divide both sides by 8. Okay, so I'm going to get 0 0.5 to the n equals 0 0.375. That is horrible handwriting. Okay, uh, so I've got that. Now, this, the trick for solving for an unknown exponent here. Okay, uh, we need to use a log or a natural log. I like to use natural logs to make this more fun to write. Okay, I'm kind of weird like that. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring n down as a multiplier. Okay, and I'm going to multiply by that the natural log of 0 0.5. Alright, because I did the natural log on this side, algebra tells us we've got to do the same thing on both sides. Okay, now some of you are like, natural log, what the hell is that? Alright, uh, for you and for what we're doing in this class, the natural log is a button on your calculator. Alright? Uh, some of you guys taking algebra 2 will learn more about that. You guys talk to your math teachers if you want to know what natural log is. Alright? I'm just a lowly chemistry teacher. I just know when we need to use natural logs. Really at our own area. Alright? Anyways, so on my TI84 Plus, my fancy calculator, the natural log is just that button. Right? So just like if you wanted to multiply something, you'd hit the little X button for times or multiply. For natural logs, you've got to push the natural log button. It's that simple for your calculator, all right? So, get n. I'm going to have to divide both sides by natural log. 0 0.5, that cancels that. All right? So, when I do that, I'm going to go natural log 0.375. Boom, 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 boom. Hit enter, divide it by. Natural log 0.5, enter. And I get 1.42, all right? So, what that tells me, so when I solve for n, is I, what I've done by going from 8 grams to 3 grams, is I've cut 8 grams in half 1.42 times. Okay? So it's not a full 1 time or a full 2 times. It's somewhere in between that time period. Okay? So n is equal to 1.42. Now, I've not finished the question because I did not solve for how long it takes to cut it in half one time, which is what the half-life is. So, what is the half-life for Carlson 60? All right, now, since I know N, right, I can now substitute that in here because I do know that my age is 12 years, right? So, I'm going to simply plug that value. So, I'm going to say now that 12 years, which is my age, is equal to T one half. If you don't know yet, times 1.42. All right? Um, and when I do my simple algebra, divide both sides by 1.42, I should get T, one half, or my half life, is equal to 8.5 years. And you guys should notice that I rounded that to two sig figs because 12 only has two sig figs. And there's my answer. All right? So, quick review, I read my prompt. I organized my information over here to figure out what I know and what I don't. I use what I know to determine which of these two equations to start with. All right, I pick the equation that I know the most information for. All right, once I do that, I solve for n usually. It's gonna be the first thing I solve for. Once I know n, I can plug it in to the next equation to get whatever it is that I'm looking for. Now, sometimes, Sometimes, I probably won't do this on the test for you guys, uh, you can tell what n is just because it's an it's even uh, interval for half-life. So if like mi was 8 and this was 4, you'd be like, oh, that 4 is half of 8, that's one half-life. I already know n is 1. Okay? So if you can see that, that's fine. That's good. That means you understand what's going on. But more often than not, in reality, we're not picking up a sample at exactly one half-life. Not very common. Okay? Alright, so last one here. Um, number 18 
on the practice exam. Grading 56 is a beta emitter with a half-life of 1,243 years. What is the mass of 12 milligram sample after 11,500 years? So, right, okay, we want to know how much we're going to have, how long it's going to take to get to a certain point or something like that. What's its mass going to be after 11,500 years? We can make a prediction using half-life, okay? So, again, I'm going to organize my information off to the side. Do I know my initial amount? Yes, I do. 12 milligrams. Okay? I don't know how much I'm going to end up with yet. I'm going to calculate that, so that's one of my question marks. Okay? I want to know how much I'm going to end up with when it's 11,500 years old. So my age is 11,500 years. Okay? My half-life is given to me, 1,243 years. Okay? Uh, I don't know how many half-lives that is, how many periods that is, but I can calculate that pretty easily. All right, so there is my information nicely organized for me by that side. So again, I need to take what I see here, <coughs> here, voice crap, all right, uh, and decide which equation to start with. All right, so which one do I know the most information for? This time, it's this one. I know both my age and I know my half-life. I can very easily solve that. I don't need to do that all the crazy stuff for this one, okay? Uh, so, here we go. I'm going to take 11,500 years equals uh, 1,243 years times n, all right? Divide both sides by 1243. And I should get my n equal to 9.25. Right? So that means in 11,500 years, I will cut it in half nine and a quarter times. All right? So knowing that, I can then predict how much I'm going to end up with Okay, using this equation. So I started with 12.0 milligrams. Okay, I'm going to cut that in half, not once, but 9.25 times. All right? So I'm going to use that as an exponent. And that will tell me, oh my gosh, how much of gradient 56 I should end up with. So 12.0, 0.5 to 9.25 power I should get, point zero point zero one nine seven milligrams equals mm. Three sig figs in that bad boy, all right? Uh, and that's it, okay? Um, test coming up. Make sure you guys do your thing and study. Uh, remember, just watching me do chemistry isn't sufficient. You need to make sure you can do this all by yourself, all right? Where you get a prompt, these two equations, and you hash it out from there all by yourself. No notes, okay? So you follow up with practice, 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 all right?